Good morning. No surprises. We are continuing in our study through the book of Romans. We're up to chapter 2, verses 17 to 29. And if you've been here for the last number of weeks, you'll know that we are currently in the, the first main section of the body of Paul's letter to the Romans. There are going to be several main sections in the body of his letter. We are going through the very first one. The first body, the first section of the body of his letter, it began in chapter 1, verse 18, and it goes right through until chapter 3, verse 20. That is the first main section of thought in the body of his letter. And really, the primary truth that Paul wants us to understand in this this section, this very first section, it's really quite simple. Paul wants for us to understand why we need righteousness from God. So what is it if someone comes up and taps you on the shoulder after this and says, what's the main main gist of this first section of Paul's letter to the Romans? You know what to say. The main gist of it is that we need to understand why we need, what? Righteousness from God in order to be placed into a right relationship with God. That's the whole thrust of this section. He wants us to know that any righteousness, any goodness that we think that we can somehow rustle up in and of ourselves is not enough to get right with God. It's not enough for us to be put into a right relationship with God simply because the good does not cancel the bad. And because what we consider to be good, well, it's really not that good, and it's not good enough in terms of God's perfect standard. And it's for this reason Paul wants us to understand that without the Lord Jesus Christ, without the, the righteousness which is given to, him from, uh, given to us from him, he wants us to understand that we are all condemned before God and that we are all hell-bound. And so how does Paul do this? How does he approach the subject to, to try to help us to better understand why we need righteousness from God, a gift given from God, to us that we might be in a right standing before him. Well, we saw that first of all, he began by addressing the Gentiles. He addressed those who didn't come from a a godly background, a spiritual background. They didn't come from a Jewish or or a Christian background. Yet he spent time explaining to them why they are in equal need of the Lord Jesus Christ, why they are still condemned even though they have had a a non-religious background. He says they're without excuse. Creation declares that there is a creator. And the reason that a person rejects the creator is not due to a lack of evidence, but it's, lack to, it's due to the, the hardness of one's heart. And then following this, we saw beginning in chapter 2, and Sam did a very good job at starting us off there, and Tom picked up where he left off, and here I am trying to you know, um, follow after, the, after their great example. But beginning at, at chapter 2, well, we've seen that Paul has turned his attention to the Jews. He started with the Gentiles, those without a, a, a spiritual heritage, those without a, a godly background, and then he shifted over to the Jews, those who did come from a spiritual background, those who did come from a background that had the knowledge of God, those who have a knowledge of the scriptures, those who came from a background who had a a knowledge of God's standard of right and wrong. And what Paul has been doing leading up to today's passage is he's been laying out some very important truths. He's been laying out truths when it comes to Jews who don't feel that they need the righteousness from God in the same way as the Gentiles do. Of course, they look at the ones without a spiritual godly background. They see how carnal they are. They see how um, outwardly unrighteous they are. And they go, well, I'm glad I'm not like him. I'm glad I'm not like her. They need the righteousness from God. But me, from a, a spiritually privileged background, well, maybe I just don't need it as much as they need it. Now, what is Paul doing? Well, he's explaining He's explaining to them that they do, in fact, need the righteousness from God in the, in the exact same way as the Gentile needs the righteousness from God. He's explained that every time we condemn another person's sin, we are actually condemning ourselves. Why? Because we do the same things. We do the same things as them. He, he ex- he's explained that when God doesn't punish us straight away for our sin... It's not because God is looking favorably upon our sin, but instead he's given us time to repent. He's explained that there are no exceptions when it comes to the fairness of God, meaning that we will all get what is eventually coming 
to us, which by the way is not a good thing if we are outside of Christ. If, we are, if, we, if our trust is in, not in Christ, that is not a good thing to get what is coming to, to us. He's explained that only those who actually do what God wants will be in a right standing with God. And that even if a non-religious person, even if a Gentile, if, if they cannot use ignorance as an excuse for their sin, well, how much less can those with a spiritually privileged background? And so all that to say, that kind of brings us right up to today's passage, chapter 2, verses 17 to 29. And what Paul is going to explain in this passage is why a Jew's privileged background or their privileged upbringing is not enough to put them into a right relationship with God. If you want to take it a step further, from what Paul explains in this passage, he actually shows how dangerous it can be. How dangerous it can be to grow up with a godly heritage. How dangerous it can be to grow up with a godly background. Now, I realize that for some of us, we're going, hang on a second. Isn't a godly background a good thing? How could that be dangerous? I realize that for some of us, this is a foreign concept to us. It sounds strange to our ears. After all, we think of children growing up with a godly background, and we usually think about that as being a good thing, which, by the way, it certainly is. However, although there are benefits of a godly upbringing, there are also some dangers that we need to watch out for as well. You see... When a person grows up with a godly background, their upbringing is going to look a lot different compared to those who haven't had a godly background. They're going to tend to hang out in the right kinds of circles. They're going to tend to know the right kinds of things. And for the most part, at least when they're younger, they're going to be seen doing the right things as well. But you see, that, that's, there lies the danger. You see, it is possible for a person to be surrounded by a godly faith community yet fail to recognize their personal need for the righteousness from God. It is possible for a person to know all the right things, to attend the right things, to hang out in the right circles, to keep their nose relatively clean, and yet fail to recognize their desperate need for the gospel and their desperate need to respond to the gospel with a repentant faith. As Paul addresses the Jews in today's passage, those who come from a spiritually privileged background, he is going to be pointing out three specific things that can actually work against a person when it comes to recognizing their need for the righteousness which comes from God. Or put in a slightly way, we're going to see in today's passage, we're going to see three dangers of growing up with a godly background. Again, we understand the original context, don't we? We understand that he is, it has to do with those from a Jewish background. However, this directly applies to children and the children among us, even today, who are currently growing up in Christian homes. It also applies directly to those who have grown up in Christian homes and who are now adults today. Those who have grown up with a godly background now, by way of an outline of today's study, there are going to be three things we're going to be looking at. Three dangers. Three dangers of growing up with a godly background. The first danger of growing up with a godly background is, in verse 17, forgetting that our heritage cannot save us. That's danger number one. The second danger of growing up in a, in a godly background is forgetting that our knowledge cannot save us. That's verse 17 to verses 24. And a third danger of growing up with a godly background is forgetting that ceremony cannot save us. That's verses 25 to 29. So if we were to summarize it, what is the passage about? Well, it gives us some dangers of growing up with a spiritually privileged godly background. Forgetting that our heritage can't save us. Forgetting that our knowledge can't save us. Forgetting that ceremony cannot save us save us. And so let's give our attention, first of all, to verse 17. And this is where we see the first danger of growing up with a godly background. And that first danger is simply <clears throat> forgetting that our heritage cannot save us. So let's give our attention now to your Bibles in verse 17. I'm only going to be reading out the first um, six words that are there, really. And this is how Paul begins in verse 17. He says, indeed, you are called a Jew. 
Now, let's just stop there for a moment. Indeed, you are called a Jew. When Paul says this, when he says, indeed, you are called a Jew, he is primarily referring to one thing, and that one thing is heritage. You see, for a Jewish person, being called a Jew, it was far more than just identifying of one's ethnicity. Instead, to be called a Jew was seen as a badge of spiritual honor and a badge of spiritual pride. After all, the Jewish, in the Jewish way of thinking, to be called a Jew was to identify oneself as, as being the unique and the especially favored people of God. That's what it was to be called a Jew. Now, how did they arrive at that conclusion? How was it that the Jews arrived at the conclusion that they were the, the specially favored people of God? Well, it stems right back to God's promise given to Abraham, who happened to be the father of the Jewish nation. Back in Genesis chapter 12 and verses 1 to 3, you'll see it pop up. Listen to the promise that God gave to Abraham all the way back then. He says, Now the Lord has said to Abram, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, it is clear that God promised a blessing for the Jewish people. However, over time, what happened is that the Jews, they lost sense of their unique and their divine calling. As you see that there in verse 3, God says that the Jews were meant to be a channel through which the rest of the world would be blessed. That was God's intention. Yet they lost sight of that calling, didn't they? They lost sight of that calling. Instead, they had no desire to, to, to take those God-given truths, to take those God-given blessings and share them and communicate them with the rest of the world so that the other nations could be drawn to God as well. They had no desire to do that. Instead, the, the Jewish nation became very much like the prophet Jonah, and we know what happened there. They became reluctant to share about God with other nations in case those other nations repented and would therefore be spared of the judgment to come. They liked being the only nation that was favored by God, and they wanted to keep it that way. Instead of recognizing that God's favor was on them because of God's grace and because of God's grace alone, they began to think that God's favor was on them because there was some kind of goodness in them. In other words, in short, the Jews felt superior, spiritually superior, and they, they felt spiritually proud. And instead of boasting in God, who graciously bestowed his blessings upon them, what did they begin to do? They began to boast in themselves. They began to think that it had to do with their own greatness for having received that blessing. And what's more, because the Jews were physical descendants of Abraham, they assumed, there was an assumption in their thinking that the spiritual blessing of God would somehow automatically be passed on down to them just because of their background, just because of their heritage. But you know what? They were wrong. It would not be automatically passed down just because of their background or because of their heritage. Jesus made this very clear when he walked upon the earth. For instance, in John chapter 8, verses 37 to 44, listen to what Jesus said to the religious Jewish leaders, and you'll see it behind me. It says, he, Jesus says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. And they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. And they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God nor have I, 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 I have I come, um, come of myself, but he has sent me. 
Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, and look what he says there. doesn't say Abraham, does it? You are of your father, the devil, and desires um, of, and the desires of your father you want to do. And he was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand for truth because there is no truth in him. These are talking to the top guys here. These are talking to the religious Jewish leaders in that day. And all you can do is sort of come away from that and go, ouch. They're claiming spiritual blessing from the Abrahamic you know, promise passed down. And here he's saying, guess what? Your heritage is of that of Satan. I mean, that's a bit of a hard pill to swallow, isn't it? You see, the Jews were not overly concerned about true repentance. They weren't overly concerned about faith toward God. But they thought that their heritage was enough to automatically place them in favor with God. Again, they were grossly mistaken. Listen to what, how John the Baptist puts it. John the Baptist speaking to the religious Jewish leaders. He says in Matthew chapter three, verses five, uh, uh, seven to five, uh, seven, seven to five, seven to nine. He says, "But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he, this is John the Baptist, said to them, "Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that, Ab that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Are we starting to get the picture of what both Jesus and John the Baptist are now, the, the, the thrust of what Paul is going to be saying in this passage? What are we seeing here? What we are seeing is that the Jews' heritage it gave them a false sense of security that everything was okay. Their background, their heritage gave them the sense that everything was okay between themselves and God. Because they were called Jews, they thought that the blessing of God was going to be automatically applied to them despite having a heart attitude that was far from Him. And in a similar way, I think it's kind of easy for us to see how this directly applies to children who are raised within a Christian home today. Just think about it. As long as you can remember, your parents have probably identified themselves as Christians. And what's more, those around you know your family as being a Christian family. From a very early age, if someone was to ask you, are you religious? Are you spiritual? You would probably answer by saying, yes, I'm a Christian. And because you have come from a Christian background, there are probably all sorts of Christian things that have been part of your life from a very early age. Perhaps your family prays before meals. Perhaps your family has regular times of family worship where you read the Bible and pray and sing together. Perhaps your family remembers the birth of Jesus at Christmas time, remembers the death and the resurrection of Jesus at, at Easter. It's likely that the vast majority of people that uh, your family's friends, well, they, it's very likely that they call themselves and they identify themselves as Christians as well. It's not uncommon for you to overhear conversations with people that are talking about God, talking about the Bible, talking about topics like salvation. And then, of course, if you're homeschooled or you attend a Christian school, all of the curriculum that you're being taught from it all has a Christian worldview then again, you come to church most Sundays and you become familiar, don't you? We become familiar on, on how the church service is structured. We know when to sing. You know when to stand. You know when to close your eyes. You know when to jot down notes. And on one hand, it is an incredible privilege to be raised in a godly Christian, with a godly Christian upbringing. There are so many things and so many problems and issues that you won't have to face. There are so many difficulties that you won't have to experience. But on the other hand, your Christian heritage can also be quite dangerous for the similar reason it was dangerous to the Jews that Paul was writing to in this passage. You see, it is possible for a child to think that they are in a right relationship with God because they, they've been growing up in an environment with others who claim a right relationship with God. But here's the important thing to understand. 
It is possible for a person to be raised in a Christian home. It's possible for a person to call themselves a Christian. It's a person, possible for a person to be accustomed to saying grace before meals, participating in family worship, be taught from a Christian curriculum, attend Bible studies, church services, and yet, if they were to die today, they would still be dead in their trespasses and sins, and they would be going to hell. That's the simple reality. But here's the thing. Your Christian background, your Christian heritage, the Christian activities that you are part of, none of these things can put you into a right relationship with God in and of themselves. Simply because your Christian background does not take away the punishment that your sins deserve. Only one person can do that, and that person is Jesus. And so what this means is that a person who was raised in a good Christian family they need to trust that Jesus died for their sins in the exact same way as a person who has grown up in a non-Christian family with a background that looks a lot different than yours. Or we could put it this way. Just because you're raised in a Christian family, it doesn't mean that you're going to be automatically going to heaven. What you need to understand is that God does not have any grandchildren. God only has children. In other words, you can't just get to heaven because your parents are going to heaven. It just doesn't work that way. I, I wish there was a way, and I sometimes wish there was a way that I could trust you know, Christ on behalf of my children to allow them entrance into heaven to receive righteousness from God, but it doesn't work that way. If you want to have a right relationship with God, if you want to have your sins forgiven, if you want to know that you're going to go to heaven when you die, you need to do what every single other person needs to do, regardless of what background they come from. You need to admit that you have sinned against God. You need to admit that you are deserving of hell because of your sins. And you need to personally trust that Jesus died for your sins, taken upon himself the punishment that your sins deserve, so that you don't need to take the punishment for them yourself. You see... Your parents can't trust Jesus on your behalf. They can't respond with a repentant faith on your behalf. This is the way that you must respond yourself. Don't forget that your Christian upbringing, your Christian heritage, it cannot save you. Only Jesus can save you. So if there are any here today that have not placed their faith and their trust in Jesus as the one who has died for their sins, on their behalf, the encouragement, of course, is do not delay. Get right with God today. Don't let your privileged, godly background become a danger to you, forgetting that your heritage cannot save you. And so this is the first thing that Paul points out. This is the first danger that we can draw by what it is that Paul is, is, is saying from today's passage. The first danger of growing up with a godly background is forgetting that our heritage cannot save us. But there's also a second danger that Paul points out here, and this is found in verses 17 to 24, and that danger is forgetting that our knowledge cannot save us. And so I want you to look down now, and we're going to read through verses 17 to 24 where Paul makes the case. He says in verse 17, Indeed, you are called a Jew, and rest on the law, and make your boast in God, and know his will. And approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? Do you preach that a man should not steal? Do you steal? Do you say you do not commit adultery? Do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. In this section, we see that Paul communicates a second danger of growing up with a godly background, and that danger has to do with knowledge of God's word. This is what Paul refers to when he uses the phrase, the law, in this passage. He is talking about all that God has revealed to us through the scriptures. 
Now, if there was one thing that the Jews were confident in, you know what it was? It was their knowledge of the Bible. It was their knowledge of Scripture. They knew about God's covenants. They knew about God's blessings. They knew about God's curses. They knew about God's warnings. They knew about God's promises, His moral standards, and His character. And what's more, the Jews took great pride in the fact that how well they knew Scripture, how well they knew God's Word, and how well they highly praised God's Word as well. As Paul puts it, you notice it there in verse 17, he says, you rest on the law, you make your boast in God, you know His will, you approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law. They knew these things. They knew what God approved of. They knew what God disapproved of. That They knew what God rewarded. They knew what God punished. They knew, um, you know, they knew large portions of Scripture. In fact, the Jews were taught to memorize large portions of Scripture, both systematically and thoroughly. And to try to show how spiritual they were, what they would do is that Jews would often go and recite these large portions of Scripture in a public setting so that everyone could see them and everyone could hear them, drawing a lot of attention to themselves of just how godly and how spiritual they were because of their knowledge. But you see, it didn't stop there. Not only did the Jews find spiritual confidence in what they knew, they also found spiritual confidence in what they taught. They felt that they were so clued up, that they were so learned when it came to Scripture, they didn't need to be instructed by anyone. Instead, they saw themselves as being in the place of instructing others. And notice how Paul puts it there in verses 19 and 20. He says, you are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. You can kind of almost picture what the Jews would have been thinking when reading this part of the letter, right? You can imagine that some of the Jews would start to yell, Amen! Yes, this is us! I wholeheartedly agree with everything that you've said so, Paul, uh, said so far, Paul. Yes, I agree with Paul. We do have a spiritual heritage. I agree with you, Paul. We are those with superior knowledge more than anyone else. Keep telling us, Paul. Keep, go- keep it going. Keep telling us how spiritual we are. I'm loving this. Give me more. Keep heaping on more about how great and how spiritually privileged I really am, Paul. But is that what Paul does? That's not what he does, does he? Because if you notice in verses 21 to 24, what does he do? He begins to point out a blind spot in their thinking. Paul goes on to show them the inconsistency between what the Jews knew and how it is that the Jews lived. You see, although the Jews upheld Scripture, although they praised Scripture, they failed to live consistently according to what they knew. What the Jews failed to recognize is that knowing God's Word and obeying God's Word, they're not the same thing. It is possible for a person to know all the right things, but to, fail, to, to fall short and how those things are actually lived out in their own lives. So it was for the Jews. Notice how Paul puts it in verse 21. He says, You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Do you see what he's doing here? He's saying, look, the things that you know so well, the things that you teach others, the things that you esteem highly, Don't you see the inconsistency in your life? Don't you see the true reality of your heart? You are doing the exact same things that you know to be wrong. Esteem is that there's a difference between esteeming God's standard and living according to God's standard. And they they missed that fact. They missed that reality. Because the Jews knew all the right things because they knew what God wanted, they somehow felt justified that they were justified by God, that their superior knowledge of Scripture was enough to justify them. They felt that that they were somewhat on a, a better footing with God because of all that they knew. But what do we see Paul does in verses 21 to 23? He points out to them the inconsistency between what they know and what they do. Just a little bit of an, just a little bit of a take a moment to pause here. We have to understand that when God judges us, 
He's not going to judge us just by what we know. He's going to judge us according to what we do. You could know the Bible perfectly, but if you have not, if you have failed to keep the Bible perfectly, he will judge you according to your works if your faith is not in Christ. And so because they weren't actually obeying God's word, the superior knowledge of Scripture didn't help them one bit. It didn't help them one bit when it came to the relationship with God. It's for this reason Paul quotes in verse 24 there. He quotes Isaiah 52 verse 2 to point out that the Jews' hypocritical boasting of knowledge of the Scripture, it was actually a dishonor to God because not only could God see the inconsistency, so could everyone else. Or as he says there in verse 24, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you as it is written. So what are we we seeing here? We are seeing here that the Jews' knowledge of Scripture gave to them a false sense of security that everything was okay between themselves and God. And you know what? That really is one of the dangers of knowledge. That's one of the, the dangers of accumulating knowledge about God's Word. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, Paul says that knowledge puffs up. It has a tendency to do that. In other words, knowledge can, can cause us to become blinded to the truth about ourselves. It can cause us to have somewhat of an inflated view of ourselves. That's what knowledge can do. For the Jews, it caused them to be blinded for their need of a savior. It caused them to be blinded for their need of the righteousness that can only come from God. It caused them to think that the blessing of God was just going to automatically be passed down to them because they knew all the right things, despite the disobedient actions of their own hearts. And in a similar way, we can see how this can directly apply to children who are raised within a Christian home today. More specifically, we can see how this directly applies to children who are part of this very church here at Redemption Church. You see, for the most part, the minds of children are filled with the knowledge of God's Word right from the moment that that they are born. Sometimes it's even before they are born physically. We had some babies that are born and they would have heard a fair bit of preaching, a, a lot of Bible reading, prayers with the family at home, even in the womb, even before they were birthed and delivered. But then from the moment of their delivery, they just hear God's word. Right from the moment that they're born, from their earliest memories, they recall Bible stories being read to them. From the t- by the time that a child is 18 years old, if they've been at redemption for that time, they would have heard approximately 936 hours of expository Bible teaching by the time they're 18. If their family gathers together for family worship, let's say two or three times a week for 20 minutes or so, well, that works out to about 1,872 hours of Bible reading and discussion in their home by the time that they are 18 years old. And you want to add midweek Bible studies into that? You want to add youth camps into that? You're going to arrive at roughly about the same amount of hours as it takes to achieve a bachelor's degree at university. That's how much time and content has been poured into the minds of children in our church. By the time a child is 18, they'll most likely be familiar with many theological terms. They'll be familiar with many of the categories of systematic theology. They'll be familiar and have a reasonable grasp on the context of many New Testament and Old Testament books of the Bible. They will know the difference between right and wrong according to God's standard. They're going, and on one hand, we we think about this and we consider this and we think, what a tremendous privilege it is to be raised with a sound knowledge of the Word of God. What a privilege it is for children to be brought up in, in families in such a way. After all, Biblical knowledge is required for both salvation and also our sanctification. We need it to save our souls, but we need it to change our lives. And the children in this church have been having their lives filled with the Scriptures. So on one hand, it's an incredible privilege. But on the other hand, Christian knowledge can also be very quite dangerous for a similar reason that it was dangerous to the Jews who Paul was talking, uh, talking to. Knowing the right things can sometimes cause a person to think that they're doing the right things when in fact they are not. Knowing and doing are two different things. They're not the same thing. 
And what Paul make, has made very clear both earlier in the passage and also in this, this, earlier in the chapter and also here is that as sinful human beings, we don't always do what we know to be right. And what this means, because we don't always do what we know to be right, we are equally condemned before God, we are equally deserving of the judgment of God, just in the same way as those who have absolutely no Bible knowledge at all. We have to understand that. Those who have heard so much Bible uh, up until the time they're 18 years old that they could pass a, a, a bachelor's degree at university because of how much study and how, much, how learned they had become, we have to understand that they are no better off, spiritually speaking, in terms of their salvation than one who has, has had, doesn't know a single book of the Bible. In other words, our Bible knowledge is not enough to get us right with God. It's not enough to be granted entrance into heaven because our Bible knowledge cannot pay for our sins. Only Jesus can pay for our sins. And so again, what is the encouragement here? If you have not already placed your faith and trust in Jesus as the one who died for your sins on your behalf, the encouragement is not to delay that. Don't let your Bible knowledge give you a false sense of security that everything is okay with you because if your trust is not in Jesus, you are dead in your trespasses and sins and if you are to die today, you'd be going to eternal hell. Your Bible knowledge doesn't, will not get you to heaven. Your Bible knowledge does not get you to a right relationship with God. Only Jesus can do that. Don't let your privileged, godly background become a danger to you, forgetting that your Bible knowledge cannot save you. Only Jesus can do that. And so this is the second danger that we can draw from what it is that Paul is communicating in today's passage. The first danger is what? First danger of growing up in a godly background, forgetting that our heritage can't save us. Second danger of growing up in a godly background, forgetting that our Bible knowledge or our knowledge can't save us. And this now leads us to a third and final danger of being, of being raised in, with a godly background. That's found in verses 25 to 29, forgetting that ceremony cannot save us. And by ceremony, what are we talking about? By ceremony, we're talking about those outward rituals, those outward practices that are practiced within a faith community. For us as Christians, what comes to mind? Automatically, what comes to mind has got to be Baptism, the outward ritual, ceremony of baptism, followed probably closely by, behind by communion. As for the Jews, it was the practice of circumcision. So let's give our attention to what it is that Paul is saying here, picking up in verse 25. Look at how Paul talks about this. He says in verse 25, For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirement of the law, will, his uncirc uncirc will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who, even with your written code and, uh, and circumcision, a and a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. The circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Back in Genesis chapter 17, God instituted the practice of circumcision, and he did so for the Jewish people as an outward sign of his covenant between Abraham and Abraham's descendants. The outward physical practice of circumcision, it had a much deeper spiritual significance because it represented somewhat of the cutting off of the flesh, the removal of the flesh, in order for a person to be set apart to God. It was meant to re represent something spiritual in nature. It wasn't just a physical health issue or anything like that. It, was, it, was just, it represented something deeper and more spiritual. However, as important as it was for the Jew, circumcision was only ever an outward symbol it was only ever an outward symbolic practice that had no power in and of itself. 
but it served as a helpful reminder. It it served as a reminder of God's covenant relationship with his people. But here's the thing. The outward practice of circumcision, it was never, ever intended to be a substitute for a heart that loves God, that serves God, that obeys God. It was never meant to be a substitute for that. But the Jews lost sight of that. They lost sight of that very truth. Regardless of their heart response to God, they felt that everything is okay between themselves and God because I've been circumcised. I've gone through the ceremony. I've done the outward ritual. So regardless of the state of my heart, I'm okay because I've done the outward ritual. But their thinking was wrong. Can we see what Paul says about this in verses 25 to 29? In verse 25, in so many words, Paul is saying, look, the outward ritual, it only benefits your relationship with God if it's also accompanied with an obedient heart. Otherwise, that outward ritual, it becomes of no spiritual value. And then in verse 26, he turns it around and he says, hey, if there is a person who hasn't gone through and done the outward ritual... But if they have an obedient heart response to God, can't you see this actually benefits their relationship with God? You see, similar to heritance and similar to knowledge, the Jews had forgotten that the outward physical ritual of circumcision was not enough to excuse their disobedient hearts. And to drive this point home even further, Paul makes it crystal clear in verses 28 and 29 What really pleases God? What really pleases Him? And by the way, it's not the ritualistic things that we do outwardly. But instead, what really pleases God is a heart that obeys and honors God inwardly. In verse 28, notice it there. He says, do you want to know what it really takes to to be set apart as one of God's children? It's not some kind of symbolic ceremony, but it's a matter of the heart. It's a heart that is set apart for God. That's what truly sets apart a person as a child of God. Or as Paul puts it in verse 29, circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. What Paul is saying is that a person who is truly set apart for God, it involves the spiritual matter of the heart, not just an outward ritualistic ceremony. So what are we seeing here? What do we see from what it is that Paul has explained to us here? We are seeing here is that the, the Jews' ceremony of circumcision, it gave to them a false sense of security. They were circumcised physically and it gave them a false sense of security thinking that everything was okay between themselves and God. It caused them to think that the blessing of God would somehow automatically be applied to them because they had, after all, completed the outward ritual. But as they were with heritage and knowledge, they were mistaken, grossly mistaken. They were wrong in their thinking. And in a similar way, It's easy to see how this directly applies to children who are raised with a Christian or godly background and how it applies directly to the outward ritual of baptism. You see, growing up in the church, you get to see baptisms take place from time to time. We have some baptisms which will be witnessed next week. And as you get older, you may begin to see some of your friends beginning to think about baptism. Friends who are your own age thinking about baptism. And when you see your friends being baptized, there's always going to be a temptation. There's going to be a temptation in a child's heart to say, because they're doing it, I want to do it as well. But sometimes the motivation for doing so is not out of a a genuine heart response to God. Instead, it's because they see other people doing it and they want to do it as well. Now, children, here's a very important thing to understand. If your motivation for wanting to be baptized is only because you see other people doing it, you just want to simply be like others who are around you, you have to understand this. 
you have to understand that your baptism will not do you any spiritual good. A, a person can say, I'm a Christian because I've been baptized. But unless their baptism reflects a true heart change towards God, a heart that admits their sin, a heart which is truly trusting in Jesus as the one who died for their sins, again, their baptism will mean nothing in terms of their relationship with God. And if anything, this is where baptism can actually become a danger. Because it can sometimes cause a person to think that they are a Christian and that they think that they are going to heaven when they die, when in fact they are not. Think about this. There are going to be plenty of people who are baptized who will be spending an eternity in hell. Jesus said in that day there will be some who come and say, Lord, Lord, we knew you. We did these things for you. They were involved in in, in churchy, Christian types of, you know, backgrounds and communities, doing all the outward stuff right. But Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. You went through all the outward things right, but your heart was far from me. You see, a person is not baptized in order to become a Christian. A person is baptized because they are a Christian, and that's the difference. The outward ceremony of baptism is simply a a symbol of an even greater reality which is actually taking place within a person's heart. It's a symbol of a person's heart that has been truly changed, which now loves God. That heart loves God and, and trusts God and wants to follow God for all of their lives. For the children who are among us, who have already been baptized, let this be a challenge to you. Let it be a reminder to you, if if you're a child and you've already been baptized, let this be a reminder to you of what it means to to truly be a Christian. By the way, it has nothing to do with the physical act of baptism, but it has everything to do with your inward heart response to the Lord Jesus Christ. If there are children here today who are being baptized... And if your faith is not in the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to understand that your baptism in the past has not put you into a right relationship with God in the present. And if this is you, then be sure to respond to Jesus today, trusting that in his sacrifice, he, he died upon the cross, he took the punishment for, for your sins, he's paid for your sins, past, present, future. Make sure that your trust is in him today and not in the fact that you got plunged under some water however many years ago. For those of, among us who are yet to be baptized, maybe those of us, those of you who are growing up in Christian families, you're yet to be baptized. If you are thinking about baptism Make sure that you're thinking through that carefully. Make sure that you're thinking, that, thinking through and making sure that you're doing it for the right reasons. Remember that baptism cannot save you, but instead it has to do with a, a symbolizes a heart that is truly trusted that Jesus has died for you on your behalf. So, what is the encouragement? Don't get baptized. No, I'm not saying don't get baptized. The encouragement is be sure to pursue baptism not just because everyone else is doing it, but be sure to pursue baptism because you want to publicly identify with your Lord and your Savior, Jesus Christ. That is the motivation. Now, in closing, hopefully we can see the relevance of today's passage. For the children among us, hopefully, if you the children among us, hopefully you can see the relevance to you. For the parents among us. Hopefully we can see the relevance to the parents, that we just don't become blinded just because our kid does all the right stuff, knows the right stuff, has even gone through the ceremonies and all the rest of it, being part of a faith community. But hopefully our discipleship goes a little bit deeper than that, looking at the matters of the heart. And also, hopefully it's an encouragement to those of us who have perhaps been raised in a a godly family, in, in in a Christian family, and who are now adults. May you be challenged to think about that yourself. It's not your heritage 
that saves you. It's not your knowledge that saves you. It's not the ceremony that saves you. It is the Lord Jesus and the Lord Jesus alone. Although there are tremendous benefits of a godly heritage, although there are tremendous benefits of knowledge of Scripture and of ceremony, we have to remember that there are also limitations to these things as well. And so let's be mindful of those limitations, never substituting the godly upbringing for a true heart response, repentant faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. And for the children among you, among us here today, children, be sure to thank your parents for providing you with a godly upbringing. You see, although your upbringing cannot save you, it does provide for you an environment where you can hear the gospel over and over again, trusting that God will change your heart as you respond to that gospel. And children, we want to to let you know today that is the hope and the prayer of every single member in this church, that you would come to a personal saving faith in Christ, that you wouldn't be blinded and deceived by your background and your heritage and just being in Christian circles, but, but you would realize as good as your background and the community is, that is not enough to save you. But it's our hope and prayer that every child here, personally in the quietness of their own heart, would trust in Jesus alone, that he was the one who died for their sins in their place, that he rose again from the dead, ascended to heaven, and is now offering you the hope of eternal life. If you admit that you have sinned against God, if you admit that your sins deserve the judgment of God, but knowing that you can escape that hell penalty because Jesus paid it on your behalf and put your trust in him to get from this life into the next. Children, we want to let you know that the members of this church are praying for you, that you would respond in this kind of way. But the encouragement from today's passage is make sure that your trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ, not in your heritage, not in the ceremony, not just in your knowledge, but in Jesus and Jesus alone. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us here today. Thank you for the reminder that we need righteousness from from God because only Jesus can save. And Lord, I do pray for for those among us who have this challenge. I pray for the, the children and the parents, the adults who have grown up in Christian homes. Help us to be mindful of these truths. Help us to not just be playing church, playing Christianity, thinking everything's okay because there's outward conformity, but... Help us, to, help us to all be pushing each other and directing each other to the Lord Jesus Christ as the one whom is the only one who can save us from our sins because he paid for our sins. Be working in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>